that Friends, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, fellow Methodists, our friends who are viewing us from the different parts of our connection, I take this time this evening to warmly greet you in the most wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, saying to all of you sons and daughters of Africa, grace and peace be upon you. Thank you once more and once again for welcoming Wesley Guild SA into your space this evening. I am standing in for Reverend Mbuiselo Stemele, who usually coordinates for us. And I am not alone this evening. I am with Uayanga Sali, who also is standing in for Sister Fata. Um, and as we seek to identify different young people around our connection and affording them these opportunities of um, uh, facilitating these uh, programs. Friends, without any further waste of time, I just want to ask you from wherever you are that we all bow our heads and start this yet another program with a word of prayer. Come. Let us pray. Tigo on a manda onke. Is it in go see in his your zong is chile gekue? Nengano go zong and go see Zazi when gue. Egunga conan and go see into a fishageleo gue. Togisagan go see Nangobub Sugo in Kumbulo Zentrizozetu. Gogu perfum lela, omoya wako, o inwele. Sisa sig tand and go see, go funny leg leo. Ne gamala con go see, elinwele, silbong and go fezig leo. As is in dosias tela, as we place our guest yet again this evening in the palm of your hand. Knowing very well, Lord, that in the palm of your hand, Nothing can ever snatch us away. And so lead and guide us. Lord, we ask that you disturb us this evening. Amen. Friends, as I had intimated earlier that I am not alone, I am with Uprada Uayanda Sali, uh, who will uh, be taking your comments and um, relating them to the guest that we have this evening. Friends, mine really without a waste of time knowing that we only have an hour to be here with you. I want to present to you this evening um, the one of the sons of this soil, Ubrada uh, Mandashe. Ubrada Mandashe, I always say when I get an opportunity to introduce him, that if I were to begin, um, chances are the entire hour will be spent um, uh, trying to introduce him. But I just want to highlight that he is a lecturer at the University of Forte um, in the Department of Accounting. Also, oh, he was a lecturer at CPUT 
Cape Peninsula University of Technology and also at Water Sisulu University. Ubladaw Mandashe is a motivational speaker. He is a debate coach. He is a writer and he is a pan-Africanist, true and true. So he is one of those that we refer to as the noble sons of this soil. O Pradamandashe is um, the deputy to advocate Unuga of Walter Sulu University. And also he is the deputy president of the Pan-Africanist Congress of the people of Azania. He has written a book. And whenever I, I, I refer to this book, I always say he chose to write and embark on fiction because he wrote about love. And the title of the book, for those who may be interested, uh, is the blind thing that uh, sees. And though that is the book he wrote in 2018. So you may want to look for that book and he is busy doing some work on leadership. And I hope I would also, the contributions that I have made would uh, farm, found a space in that book. And he is here with us this evening. He is the friend uh, to the Methodist people. He is a friend because the Methodist people in 19, uh, under the leadership of Reverend Mvume Dandala had taken a resolution and have taken a stand that in its nature, it's pan-Africanist when it adopted the vision of a Christ healed Africa for the healing of the nations. And so because of that posture and that stand, Uplada Mandashe and all Pan-Africanists all around our continent and those in diaspora are a friend of the Methodist Church. is here uh, to talk to us this evening about uh, what we normally hear about the IMF and the World Bank. And I hope that in his um, a paper, he has said that he shall submit a paper after the, this presentation, which will be available to all of us, those who may need it. I hope is going to take us in the historic developments of the IMF as we know it today. And so this is the man that loves um, history. This is a man that has passion for philosophy, politics, religion, and economics. And I have no doubt in my mind that those, all those that I have um, um, highlighted, you shall hear a bit of them. He is the first man to say that Aristotle philosophized what he termed nonsense. Uh, so his love for philosophy uh, 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 surpasses uh, you know, our our knowledge and understanding. So we welcome Pradamandashe. Pradamandashe, I now hand over to you, my brother, as I welcome you with this, your favorite song of Ngosi Sigelela in Africa, after which you can then Give a emitter, does it? Give a emitter, yeah, thank you, Reverend. Um, as I begin, I would like to invite you and your audience to imagine with me the following scenario. Suppose that your child gets kidnapped by gangsters. They then demand that you pay them a ransom money if you want your child back. 
But you actually you anxiously ask them, how do I know that you will return my child again after paying you the ransom money? They reply with arrogance. If you want your child back, you will send the money. Out of concern, you further ask, but how do I know that you won't kill her after you get the money? And the gangster leader replies, you have to take my word for it, that what I say is what I will do. I am a man of my word. Seeing that you have no choice, you pay the money and wait for the gangster to release your child. But they don't release the child. A little bit angered, but contained. And because you, want, you don't want to put your child at risk, you go on your knees and you beg the gangster. And so the gangster says, you've got to pay. And then you pay and you wait. But the gangsters don't pay, don't bring the child back. And then you go on your knees because you don't want to risk the child's life. You go on your knees and you ask them, but you promised to return my child. Instead of returning your child, the gang asks you to pay more money. They swear this time around that they will deliver the child, hoping that the gangsters will have enough of it and also feel pity for you, you pay some more money. But the more you pay the money, the more they ask for more. And the more the situation becomes helpless, the more you believe that there is the slightest chance that they might return the child. You are still paying that gangster today, hoping that your child will come back. What a pity, Reverend, in this scenario. But in this scenario, you represent the people, the kidnapped child, represents your country or our country. The gangster represents the big animal called the IMF. It is this gangster that I intend to talk about. And with these words, I should also like to greet you and your audience. To understand, Reverend, why South Africa is a beggar of loans from the IMF, you and I, should and must go back in history to get the answer to that question. We have no other choice. In history, we shall find the footprints of the IMF, the trail of evidence that the IMF, the gangster organization, I say it is, is indeed a true gangster, because that's what I call the IMF, a gangster organization. How was then this gangster organization conceived? I believe, Reverend, that the IMF was in the womb of four historical events. The first of these events was the Russian Revolution by the Bolsheviks, which overthrew the Tsar in 1917. The second one was the rise of Hitler to power in 1933 and the establishment of Nazism as an ideology in Germany. And of course, the German would lead us into a war, a Second World War in 1939. The third was the collapse of the British Empire. The last, perhaps the most important, what I call a little horn talked about in the Bible, is the United States, was the rise of the United States. This even little horn, Reverend, was the USA, as I say, and it was rising very fast since towards the end of the 19th century. In fact, let us call the United States the version of Great Britain because it was founded by Great Britain after Columbus displaced and killed indigenous citizens of America, the Indians, as he called them at the time. For those who might be interested, Howard Zinn provides a systematic account of how this happened in his book entitled The History of the Peoples of America. These factors, Reverend, con Reverend contributed to the coming together of the gang stars of the West to form the IMF in 1945. This happened after a long negotiation between the USA and the United Kingdom, the UK, from 1936. And some people see the IMF beginning in 1945, and they think it was just formed at the time. 
it was always pregnant in 1936. The negotiators here were Harry Dexter White for the United States and the celebrity economist, Lord John Maynard Keynes, whom I am confident that if you look at any economics textbook, you are less likely not to find John Maynard Keynes. Some people, when they talk about expansionary fiscal policy, they always refer to the Keynesian theory of money. But this negotiation was quickened, this negotiation between Lord Maynard Keynes and Harry Dexter White. It was quickened by the abandonment of the gold standard by the UK in 1931, by the US in 1933, and by France and all other states in 1936. What this abandonment meant was that there was now a system of a free floating fiat or paper money, which would no longer be backed by gold. For example, when you have a 10 rands in your pocket, what makes you believe that it has any meaning, any sense? What backs that 10 rands? Nothing, it's just a legal faith in it. This allowed countries to cheapen their currencies in an attempt to increase their exports to other countries. In a sense, you can call this the currency wars of the 1930s. And we know, Reverend, that uh, these days there are currency wars between the United States and China. And some of these currency wars could even be partly responsible for the COVID-19 we see today. So in a historical finance economic sense, these gangsters or kidnappers wanted to fix what they called an exchange rate to solve these currency wars. I'll say something about these exchange rates a little bit later. But what were in the meantime, the unwritten principles or rules of the IMF? And I ask this question, uh, Reverend, because as you understand, anywhere, including in the church, there are unwritten rules, the modes of behavior, the ways of being, the modes and the means of existence. These are not always written down. For example, it's not written down at home that you should, that you should uh, speak with respect to your parents and so on and so on. So the IMF since its formation had and still has three illegal um, unwritten principles. The first of these unwritten illegal principles is that every country will be forced to join the IMF by hook or crook. In this context, crooks will be allowed to join the IMF too because it is itself crooked. The second principle was that the weak nations live by the rules dictated to them by the wealthy nations. The third dirtiest and dangerous illegal principle is that the gang leaders are above the rules they make, but the weak nations themselves are at their mercy, provided they do as the IMF pleases. I will prove that these unwritten principles actually do exist as I proceed with my talk today. For now, I want to address a crucial issue, namely, how would the US, the United States, end up becoming a gang leader of the IMF in 1945? Because indeed, the United States became the gang leader. The reasons are both military and economic relevant. In the 1940s, the United States of America had improved its productive capacity in the field of war, in the field of making tools for war or making an arsenal and in the commodity production. If you read the book by Ernst Wolf in his, uh, uh, in that book, which is entitled Pillaging the World, the History of Politics and the IMF, he says that the US was producing half of the commodities of, uh, that the world produced at the time in the forties. As such, it had more goods than its population required. Naturally, this needed markets into which to sell these goods, but markets were not opened at the time. There was a lot of protectionism in the form of tariffs, trade barriers, boundaries, protection of local industries against powerful foreign corporations, including those from the United States of America, this represented an obstacle for the United States in terms of its ability to freely sell this excess production. 
again, if you read the book written uh, by Yanus Farfakis, the former uh, finance minister of Greece, um, he talks about this problem of um, excess uh, production in what he calls uh, markets, uh, societies with markets and markets in society. Another factor is that it had about a two thirds of the world gold reserve. Uh, to make things even more interesting as a rising power, the United States at the time was the only country to produce an atomic bomb. In 1945, it would test this atomic bomb at Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan. And in that event, it killed about 150,000 people. Of course, it claimed that it wanted to end the war, the world war uh, by uh, suppressing Japan. Because at the time, Japan, as a friend of the Germans, was a very strong, stubborn, forceful, non-surrendering friend of the Germans. The bomb, the US said, was the means to force Japan to surrender. So the United States claimed that it was acting in the best interest of humanity by killing 150,000 people with an atomic bomb. Interestingly, the US did this as its delegation was negotiating the establishment of the IMF. Perhaps as some analysts speculate, uh, historians and uh, uh, you know, very strong historians, uh, the IMF perhaps, I mean, the, the United States perhaps was trying to show the world that it had become a military power before any other nation could become so. But what actually gave the United States the power to direct world events, Reverend, including uh, you know, influencing the formation and the nature of the IMF and the World Bank in 1945 was that it had, be, it had been a creditor before the war. In other words, countries borrowed money from the United States before the war because they were crippled after the First World War. And so, what happened was that the United Kingdom, which was a great superpower at the time, owed the United States a lot of money after the end of the war, or it would owe it a lot of money after the end of the war. But the United Kingdom was owed a lot of money by France, and France itself could only pay the British if they could all force Germany to pay war reparations as they did in World War I. Yet the last obstacle of the United States plan for the IMF was the plan of the determined celebrity economist I've talked about earlier on, uh, John Maynard Keynes. Keynes wanted two things, Reverend. The first was that he wanted an international organization that would make getting loans easier after the World War. Because you've got to remember after the war, there would be a lot of debts and there would be a lot of economic calamity, poverty, inequality, unemployment, et cetera. So Keynes argument was that loans needed to be made easily accessible. The second thing he wanted was a new reserve currency, which he called Banco to be used as opposed to the US dollar. He lost both arguments to the US, to the what I call obstinate Harry Dexter White, who represented the United States of America. Getting loans with fair terms from the IMF and the World Bank would be difficult the US would peg the US dollar to gold and gold would become $35 an ounce. And that would be the second beginning of the gold standard, which collapsed in 1914 before the war. All other currencies of the world would be pegged to the dollar, which was itself pegged to the gold. If I can say this in layman's terms, this fixed exchange rate would cause governments to stop printing more money than there was gold in the shelves. So money was backed by gold. It was not just illegal 10 rands in the pocket backed by illegal faith in its use. It was backed by gold. And during crisis, people could redeem their money in gold. That was the proof. And that is precisely why in 1929, in the 20s, during the stock market crash, there was a serious problem with the gold standard. People rushed to the bank and demanded gold. They said, take your papers back, give us our gold. And effectively, uh, the gold, that is, that is why gold, even today, Reverend, remains a hedge, you know, 
as we speak today. It, 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 it remains a protectorate, if you like, and money is no. Money is actually meaningless. If you don't believe me, look no further than Zimbabwe. Paper money, filling a suitcase to buy a loaf of bread, papers, paper money means nothing. Gold has more material and commercial value than a piece of paper. Someday, maybe, Reverend, we will talk about the gold standard, uh, but not today. What I have said so far is sufficient at least to get us to the crux of the issue. Namely, what were the principles and aims of the IMF, at least those on paper? Because I've already explained to you those that were not on paper, the illegal unwritten principles. On paper, the IMF was formed to deal with the problem associated with floating exchange rate. It was also formed to help countries fix their balance of payments problems um, and promote economic growth and employment. For the benefit, Reverend, of those who may not know this concept because they are, not, they are students of economics, I shall endeavor to explain. And at this point, perhaps I should say, Reverend, that it is my considered point of view that everybody should learn history, economics, politics, and philosophy by force at school. It should not be an option to learn history and economics. As, as uh, Yanus Farufakis says, economics is too important to leave to the economists. So the exchange rate maybe can be summarized by a simple example, just to assist your audience. We have the rand here in South Africa as our currency. They have the dollar there in the US as their own currency. To buy a US product that costs a dollar, would require you to have about 17 rands. In other words, you need to have more rands to buy a single dollar. But the challenge is that the rand is always doomed and weaker in comparison to the dollar, as with other foreign currencies, because we buy too many things, Reverend, from the US and the rest of the world, such as China and Japan and the UK. In this way, the dollar becomes stronger because of the demand for its product by the rest of the world. This makes the rent grow weaker and weaker for as long as we buy things from abroad than buy things from South Africa. It also, mean, it also makes its power depend on constantly changing foreign commodities. That's why another economist once lamented that if the United States starts coughing, the whole world catches the flu. Think of it this way. People in the rural areas have to travel to town and go and spend their money on groceries because they don't have the things they need in their locations. In this way, rural areas remain poor because there is no economic activity taking place there. They are consumers only. So South Africa is full of consumers. It's not, it doesn't produce too many things. It consumes so many and much more. The idea of fixing the exchange rate then to return to that point and tying it to the dollar at $35 an ounce in 1945 was understood by the IMF to be a mechanism for avoiding too many changes or fluctuations in the exchange market between countries. With this idea, and because the United States had more gold and it had been a creditor and other countries' debtors before the war. So it managed to persuade the whole world to tie their currencies to the dollar and the dollar to gold because the dollar was redeemable in gold. If you like, you can also say this was not just the moment of American empire coming to the fore. This was indeed 1945, an exact moment of the dollarization and the Americanization of finance of the world. All member countries suffering from balance of payment problems could be borrowed money to fix these imbalances without printing more money in their own currencies and cause inflation. With the gold standard, which was obviously the gold standard beginning in 1945, countries couldn't, you know, countries could not go on a money printing spree 
because those papers would become worthless, as I have said, in relation to the dollar to which they were pegged. So a country like South Africa, for example, which imports a lot of things, once you start printing too much money, it's gonna become even more expensive to buy American goods. And so printing more money becomes a little bit dangerous. So the basis on which countries could be borrowed money by the gang was if the balance of payments problems were not of their own making. This was a very important rule of the IMF on paper. For you to get money from the IMF, the problems in your country should not have been made or caused by you, your recklessness, your incompetence, or things of that sort. It must be external factors. For example, it should have been an external factor in the 70s that there were oil shocks, which forced too many countries, especially some many African countries coming out of colonialism, forcing them therefore to go to the IMF to borrow money. For this kind of help in the form of loans, it's important therefore, Reverend, and for your audience to ask a question, a big question. What was the catch other than borrowing and paying interest on loan? My research supervisor always tells me, he always told me when he was teaching me at some point five years ago, that there is this important question whenever we deal with any question. And he said to me, this question was, Kui Bono, who stands to benefit? What is the catch? The IMF, and this is the catch, demanded that each country should be a member of the fund first before it could be borrowed money. You couldn't be borrowed money by the IMF or its vicious little sister called the World Bank without being a member of the IMF first. That was the big catch. Connor and others, for example, in 1986, summarized the problem better than I could possibly do. And so I should quote him as opposed to speaking from my own mind. They said, without IMF membership, no admission to the World Bank, without conformity to the IMF, then no development aid from the World Bank. But is there nowhere else from which governments can borrow money other than go to the IMF, Reverend? And this has been a question that most people have been asking, including politicians. Some of these politicians absolutely clueless about the question at hand. There are various options, Reverend. Governments sometimes borrow money from the public by issuing bonds and securities. In other words, people go and buy government bonds in return for interest. But if government is going to engage into printing more money, and their challenges, people fear buying government bonds and securities. Another alternative is that governments can borrow money, is that government can borrow money uh, or borrow cash from commercial banks. However, commercial banks generally don't trust governments. Actually, Reverend, to take you back to history again, History is replete with instances where governments defaulted on their debts, uh, debt obligations towards lenders. In his book entitled The History of Finance, Niall Ferguson reports that when governments failed, for example, to pay their debts, creditor countries would literally make war with those countries to force them to pay their money. But as you know, corporations are not governments, though they produce weapons. As such, they cannot make war with governments, so they choose not to borrow governments in fear of losing out as a result of bad debts. Banks come to know that certain governments are a risk by listening to the credit rating agencies which they have themselves employed. And these credit rating agencies, three of them very big in the world, uh, are Moody's, Filch, and standards and poor. As we know, recently standards and poor downgraded South Africa. A downgrade reverend actually means that investors become a little bit disinterested in investing their money here. I will talk about these saints called investors a little bit later, but suffice now to say that these rating agencies are employed by big corporations and serve corporate or investor interests. 
If a country's rating is below a certain level, the interest either increases or lenders refuse to lend altogether. If you are less likely to pay the banks, they also charge you more interest because to them, you are not a human being, you are a business risk. That is the logic of the market, which entrenches exploitation of desperate debtors. Anyone who has gone to a bank to borrow money, uh, either for whatever reason, they know that they get charged more interest. If they don't know, now I am telling you, that's just how it is. That's just how banks operate. But that is still more one, one last more option of banks. I mean, one, la one last option of governments if banks refuse to loan governments money. The first option is to print money, print more money. I've already showed you that the challenge with printing more money to stimulate an economy is, is that you make an assumption that the problem in the economy is money. And I want to argue that it is not necessarily money. And so that's why you can have lots of money and lots of poverty. In fact, most of the time when there's lots of money, there's also lots of poverty. Some critics, by the way, and conservatives argue that printing more money causes inflation. Though I do have a nuanced argument against this, I'm not going to address that today, perhaps some other time, unless you press me further during the question and answer period. The point I'm making is that under the current global system, once you are downgraded, once you are refused loans by commercial banks, you end up at the mercy of the gangster. And that's how all countries end up, you know, it, at the mercy of that gangster. But remember the rule which Connor pointed out. You cannot, you cannot get any loan from the IMF until you become its member. That is why I said one of the unwritten rules of the IMF was that we as the IMF are going to force everybody to become our member by hook or crook. But it's often crook that they are able to law everybody to be their member. But every gang institution, Reverend, has a gang leader or country, or there are few countries who decide what the rules are, who these rules apply to, under what circumstances, and towards which goals or purposes such rules are directed. The gang leader of the IMF, as you now know, is the United States of America, that little horn that emerged out of the great empire, followed by its deputies, Britain and France. It is the gang leader because it is the largest vote in the club. By its vote, the United States can cause loans to be given or not to be given, but to be withheld from its friends and enemies alike. This brings us to the crux of the question. What is the real aim and object of the IMF apart from and beyond its written statutes? In a nutshell, Reverend, and to your viewers, the IMF pursues four key objectives. The first is deregulation. The second is liberalization. The third is privatization. And later, and this was not put clearly in 1945, the observation of the rule of law, in other words, individual property rights. These also formed the basis of giving loans to member countries wanting loans from the IMF. In other words, if you wanted to get a loan from the IMF, you have to observe the four key principles of the IMF. So by being a member of the IMF, for example, a country is also implicitly bound up in the system of free open market principles of capitalism for short. The IMF would use its financial power to tell desperate governments of the world to entrench the ideology of the gang in their countries. Let me now apply these principles reverend using practical examples to make them clear to you and your audience in case I may have been slightly unclear up to this point. The IMF in 1958, for example, introduced a fairly new policy which forced countries to promise to do what it said, quote, take all reasonable steps, unquote, to solve the balance of problems, balance of payment problems in those countries. Reasonable steps meant deregulation, privatization, increasing taxes on the poor, decreasing company tax, 
protecting private property. By this important policy, two things would be achieved. First, stolen land would be protected. In other words, white people who stole land across Africa would no longer have to give that land back because these countries, when they take over these, uh, these colonial countries in Africa, for example, there are already white people who have stolen land. In our case in 1913, people who have already stolen about 87%. In fact, some people estimate 93% of the land. So more foreign investors, that's, and this is the second thing that would happen, more foreign investors would flow into these countries and gain entry into the local markets. In other words, on top of having colonizers keeping the land as private property post apartheid, then you also get other people, other investors coming into your country. So they come in and they compete with the local markets because the IMF demands deregulation, it demands competition. So the weaker species would compete with the strong species. In fact, it's not, as I always say, the elimination of the weak. It's the elimination of the non-entity. So they would kill local businesses. After all, who can compete with big European businesses in the market? Can you show me anyone, Reverend? And then they would leave with the capital. In other words, they would come and extract capital also. Another technique used by the IMF was to provide loans in bits and pieces, what they call trenches or phasing. A country gets a certain trench of a loan first. If it complies with the rules of the gang, it gets another trench until it fully submits to policy instructions of the gang. This raises a question about the rights um, of money lenders and the rights of those who are desperate to get the loan. What are the rights of those countries who borrow from the IMF, to be quite frank? Can the countries that get these loans influence the outcome of the negotiation for a loan in the IMF? Can Tito Mboweni, for example, be able to negotiate a good deal with the IMF? The IMF, Reverend, has about 188 member states, probably a majority of them joined by force, because indeed, I mean, the IMF is ran by roughly less than 10 countries, of course, with the gang leader at the top, the United States. Around 75% of, the, of these countries in the, in the IMF, for example, are powerless countries in terms of their voting share, because money talks. The more money you have, the more voice you have. They usually say on the streets that a man who has no money has no voice. Women would say, we can't hear you because they have no money. Money talks and people listen. Thomas Sowell, another American economist, adds. In 2015, the US contributed, for example, $58 billion. Uh, this translated to about 17% voting share for the United States. Uh, besides, the country in desperate need of loans has less to no rights in the process. It is the creditors who have the rights and the powers over the weak. Of course, everybody knows the story of Shylock wanting the power and the flesh of a borrower uh, who speculated with his goods in the sea on behalf of a friend who wanted to marry a woman of a certain beauty. Uh, those who have read The Merchant of Venice will know the story I'm talking about by Shakespeare. The rules of the IMF were and are always applied to the poor people, to underdeveloped countries. The big guns do not live by the rules, Reverend, and the big guns are above the rules. They live by their interests. They are controlled and driven by interests, not their rules. To prove this point, in 1971, Richard Nixon, the then US president, decided unilaterally to abandon the gold standard. The US needed to fund the Vietnam War, in the fight against communism. It had to increase its military spending. For the first time in the long run, the United States had a budget deficit, but it didn't matter. In 1973, the G10 countries decided to abolish the fixed exchange rate. Um, in other words, they decided to abandon the gold standard altogether. They decided that the exchange rate currency must now be flexible. Let markets determine this kind of problem, they said. In the same year, in 1973, a socialist government of Chile under Salvador Allende was overthrown 
by a USCIA supported military coup d'etat. The IMF was now financially supporting military coups and dictatorships across the Caribbean and Latin America. In Chile, for example, Salvador was substituted by the dictator, Augusto Pinochet. This dictator reversed all nationalizations which had taken place thus far. So the dictator then hired Chilean economists who had studied in the United States, in Chicago. These economists are popularly known today as the Chicago Boys. These fellows studied under the economic conservatism of the Nobel Prize winner, Milton Friedman. This dictator, Pinochet, held down all the protests by violent terror. At the same time, the Chicago Boys were setting up austerity which is a very important policy of the IMF. They were cutting spending on health, they were cutting spending on education, they were cutting uh, spending on public sector wage bill, they were cutting spending on wages, they were increasing taxes and they were lowering corporate taxes and they were increasing tariffs. And uh, Milton Friedman, uh, an ardent capitalist called this a necessary and I should quote him here so that I don't make a mistake. He called it a necessary, quote, shock therapy. In other words, to him, it was necessary for people to lose their savings and their monies just so the IMF could be paid of their debts. And that's exactly what the IMF does, isn't it? The IMF causes you to stop spending money on other things so that you can pay the debt. In many ways, this was the birth of what we today call neoliberalism, the idea that governments should let markets run themselves as if markets have no mind, have no soul or have no interest. It is interesting also that the IMF increased the loans to the Chilean government after the coup d'etat. I guess because the shock therapy was still working its magic as the people were choked into poverty and inequality. Again, because human rights, democracy, and the rule of law was not applied you, uh, I mean, you, uh, by the US, which claims to spread democracy all over the world. They were, they were applied in Zimbabwe, however, in 2001 by George W. Bush. The economy of Zimbabwe was choked to death to date, as we know. As you can see, IMF written rules don't matter. Their interests do. The rules are written for us, the gullible public. Take another example here in South Africa, for example, uh, Reverend, if you don't believe my arguments here. In 1975, Connor and others reported that the IMF gave the apartheid government $91 million. This was after excessive spending on arms purchased by the apartheid government. In 1976, in the year of the Soweto uprising, the IMF added another $390 million. These loans financed the government to buy weapons, and these weapons were used to shoot students in Soweto in 1976 on June 16. In 1977, South Africa was given another loan of $162 million, um, as if to thank it for the observation of human rights by the IMF. I guess that's what the IMF was saying. South Africa did not have to play by the rules of cutting spending as the US did not have to either. After all, apartheid had US as its friend, but the friend, the, the United States as a friend had wanted South Africa to move away from apartheid towards racial integration for its own purposes in the early eighties. As I progressed towards the end, I must warn you and your audience, Reverend, I am now going to offend you. I'm going to offend your mind and I'm going to offend your heart too. I will then beg you, call upon you to bear with me in the process. I'm going to call popular names of political saints and turn them into the beasts they have always been and the beasts they will always be. I will call a spade a spade, not a garden too. I beg you then to bear with me, like I said. Sobukwe once said, I make no apologies. Quote, it is meet that we speak the truth before we die, close quote. And die, Sobukwe did, excruciating death, Reverend 
as you know, the man himself, a Methodist, a man of absolute honesty and a man of political integrity, he died. Ernst Wolf in his book says that the United States started secret negotiations in 1983 with the South African government. This coincides with the confirmation by Neil Barnard who wrote in his book that in the 1980s, PW Botha's government started a secret negotiation with Mr. Mandela, the love of the world whose statue stands in Britain. What followed in the years during the negotiations and the years to come was the successful capture of this country by the IMF, including its vicious, list, vicious sister, the World Bank. Before elections in 1994, on page 63 of his book, Wolf reports that a secret memorandum was signed between the, the IMF and some sections of the governing party's leadership under Mr. Mandela. The memorandum made guarantees that the government uh, the governing party would guarantee neoliberal policies. The ANC would agree to cut government spending, increase interest rates, and allow international investors to flow into the country and access all areas of the South African economy. That explains, Reverend, why when Mr. Mandela was asked of his economic policy in 1991 at the United States of America during his visit there, his response was, let me also quote him here so that I don't make a problem. And if you want to listen to what he said, you can also Google his own video in 1991. He said, and I quote, I don't care whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. And I close the quote. In so many ways, you can say that we have here a white cat that cannot catch mice. Call the mice the landless people, inequality, racism, poverty, unemployment, etc. To be sure, IMF had already begun with transform transforming its rules into a post-apartheid economy, economic policy, the white cat of Mr. Mandela, three years before 1994. Value-added tax was introduced in 1991, and some people might not have known that that have always been have not always been there in apartheid South Africa. It was introduced in 1991. During the period of negotiations, actually, and interestingly, that would be introduced at 10% of products sold by businesses. To be fair, apartheid government introduced this policy. It was not the ANC that introduced it. Naturally, the black people were angry. Union leaders organized a toothless, what I call a toothless general strike against the vet. This only allowed people to vent their anger under their leadership until at last the steam cooled off. Because indeed, Reverend, the steam always cools off. The decision to introduce VET was passed regardless. The ANC government did not reverse this when they took over in 1994 because they did not want to be on the wrong side of the gang and they failed on their promise to the IMF. And besides, they gave the National Party 20 more seats than they were actually deserving. And that was part of the negotiation. They would rather be on the wrong side of the people of this country, not on the side of the IMF. But they would go further than the apartheid government did with VET. Today, as you know, Reverend, VET is at 15%. Yes, Reverend, 15%. In other words, for every 10 rands you have in your pocket, if you go and buy with it in the shop, one rand 50 of that 10 rands is likely to go to a government who both steals some of that money and hands some other portion of it to money lenders like the IMF in payment of the debt. By the way, we may still see VET going up by another percent this year or next year, or maybe soon thereafter. And there is a simple reason for that. And that is that the economy is contracting. There's less revenue. There is less money for government to spend around. It will have to come and dig it out of our pockets. Another genius of the IMF is demonstrated by what happened after 1994. The IMF was, was behind the so-called RDP, which failed dismally, actually. When the governing party promised 
to return 30% of the commercial land to Africans between 1994 and 1999, it actually could only return only 1% of it to some few Blacks, obviously politically connected Blacks and some few unconnected. The IMF and the World Bank caused the ANC government to change even that policy. It was now replaced by a market-oriented land redistribution policy. We know that according to the um, high-level panel report uh, chaired by uh, Mr. Mutlante, 100 pages of that report in chapter three are dedicated to criticizing the land policy of the governing party. The uh, land claims application, for example, can only be completed 703 years from now, I mean, from 2017. You and I know that uh, 703 years later, more than 10 generations, Reverend, of our people would have died. You and I would have even been forgotten, except that we may be remembered by people watching videos, including this one, if it is recorded. But the IMF would thank the ANC with a loan five months before the elections. We got a loan from the IMF of $850 million, which the IMF called, quote, a relief program, uh, which was meant to alleviate the plight of the poor, whatever that means. The conditions were that we must guarantee its payment by, going, by foregoing other government priorities. And I'm now nearing the end, really. And I ask you for your patience and your audience. Um, the government was about to do another blunder, Reverend. As such, as a sign of uh, a good faith towards the IMF, after 1994, the government decreased the tax that it charged on businesses from 48% to 30% between 1994 and 1999. At the time, people were losing jobs by the thousands, but businesses were getting tax breaks. Let me put the situation differently to you, uh, Reverend and the audience. The poor had to give government 10% of their money when buying goods and services at the shop. On the other hand, corporations or businesses that exploited workers on a day-to-day -day basis had their taxes cut by 18% wise people were losing jobs. So much for peace, so much for the TRC, and so much for producing a world icon, a president of peace and poverty, Mr. Mandela. Can the people be this ignorant, reverend, or is the media too powerful for our liking? What is clear from, the, from what I've said so far is that the IMF is against the people. It incorporates politicians into its cycles because it cannot do its dirty job alone. IMF, big finance and politicians gang up against the people. If there is any semblance of a complaint, any semblance of wanting to rebel against the suffocation under the IMF and finance capital in general, investors invoke their economic power to direct the country towards their interests. If you do not believe me, how about this example then? You will remember that when the fake land debate started in 2017, before national elections, investors got threatened and started holding their capital in savings. It was estimated at the time that there was about over a trillion rands lying fallow in the savings account, unused by the business because the businessmen were speculating, waiting for the departure of Mr. Zuma. But they did not know if a Zuma faction would not win an ANC election in Nazareth, you know, at that time. So these investors demanded policy certainty to secure their investment. This is another trick by the IMF, policy certainty, the rule of law. The economy contracted at the time. Mr. Jacob Zuma, who was called the cause of the, contra of the contraction of the economy, was, in my opinion, actually an effect of the whole scenario. He was also a hindrance to investors as, as, he, as much as I think he was a liar to all South Africans. It is also said to say that an old man does lie, but too many old people do lie, especially him. The whole matter got sidetracked. A massive movement came out in unity to demand that he must go. No such unity has ever, been, has ever existed in this country before 2017 and immediately thereafter and until now. This goes on to show the role of politicians in this country where the IMF is concerned. 
There is no unity now against landlessness. There is no unity against the IMF loans. There is no unity against the loss of jobs. There is no unity at all about unemployment. Of course, each party will go and use this unemployment crisis to gain more seats in parliament, not necessarily to solve the problem. The ANC may lose the elections, then what? Besides, uh, Reverend, they lie. No political party can solve unemployment in a country where the economy is run by corporations. It is a lie. These are crooks. These are filthy crooks. They don't run any business. What commodity does parliament produce? Do not be lied to, I plead with you. The crooked cannot be made straight. Read the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter one, verse 13. Recently, in 2018, as Zuma was replaced by Ramaphosa, the rand smiled against the dollar. Investors were happy. I am sure you were too, were you not, Reverend? How can anyone not be happy when the media tells us to be? Because the media tells us to feel things, to be things, and to believe things. And therefore we, the people, believe that we have now a new gentleman, a brand new gentleman, untainted, a saint indeed. But the IMF was the happiest along with the investors. They needed their men to hire a bunch of other men like him, the people like Mr. Mboweni, who believe in the principles which the IMF believes in. Mr. Zuma had a political instinct. He was not their man. West, he looked East for inspiration, not West. They hated that too. Ramaphosa has a business instinct. They loved that. This businessman suddenly emerged into popularity as did Zuma in 2007 after Mbeki. One man changed for another. You, the people of South Africa, love Cyril Isaac. Now I'm charging you, Reverend, and your audience. But you loved Zuma too, before you hated him. Others love Zuma now as they do Mbeki. You believed that things were going to be, you know, things were going to change after Ramaphosa. Let me let the book of Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse nine, speak for itself again as my witness, Reverend. And I must quote it here. The thing that has been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. And there's, no, there's, there's nothing new under the sun. So no, Reverend, and no, my dear friends, you were tricked and you blinked. You are now beginning to hate Ramaphosa too. And you will love another man. Or maybe now you will want a woman president. Or you will want a young person to be a president. But all that is vanity. Vanity of vanities, Reverend. Nothing shall come of it. Again, go to Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse 14. And the politicians and the IMF, we are chasing the wind indeed. Vanity of vanities. And we are doomed. Our children are doomed. If I am right, then I say that the great prophets, I have to say what they have said. I have to say what the great prophets have said when they were prophesying doom. One of the things they said was woe unto you. And so I say woe unto you and woe unto the deaf ear, the blind eye and the stubborn mind. If you believe that the crooked can be made straight, I send you again to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse 13. Don't pray for the IMF or for the politicians, pray for their overthrow. That is the way to deal with the problem. I say the IMF is on our neck. Nay, I say the neck of our children. Our country won't breathe as the US cop presses, as the US police presses his knee on them in the generations to come, in the neck of our generations to come. Woe unto all of us for letting this happen. When Mr. Ramaphosa came in, it was agreed that ESCOM would be unbundled. What confusion is this concept, Reverend? This unbundling is an IMF project of deregulation and privatization in the name of competition. Is keeping, lights, is keeping the lights on in our country up for grabs or competition? Should we compete about keeping lights on? Should we throw ESCOM into a competition, into the dungeon, into the abyss? What nation we have turned into if we did that? Electricity prices are going up year in, year out, Reverend, to service debts that we did not know we made. 
this sick ESCOM has a margin of over 430 billion uh, dollars. Uh, no, 430 billion rands, not dollars. It would be a lot if it were dollars. How does it pay this debt? The price of electricity will be increased once more. How do we pay? We pay by increasing the cost of electricity, the cost of cooking, the cost of taking a bath. This is what it means. Over the past few years, since 2007, electricity in my estimation has increased by 200%, as far as I can recall. I wish I was wrong, Reverend. But who pays for this increase? You and me. And so I, I say again, like the prophets did, woe unto us. What happens if ESCOM is finally sold? When it is finally sold and sent into the jungle, we are sold too to the businessman. And I then say, woe unto us, Reverend, woe unto us again. Finally, the switching of lights will depend on whether governments make business happy. If government does not make business happy with its policies, electricity will be switched off. It will be an instrument of further directing political economic direction. In the 1920s, when the Boers, when the Boer government um, uh, and the white government caused the establishment of ESCOM, they would never privatize because they knew that keeping lights on cannot be up for grabs, cannot be um, put at the whims of an individual. Woe unto us, then let me say. We have eyes, but we cannot see. We have ears, but we cannot hear. Shall we also not hear, though we have ears? Shall we also do nothing? Shall we also take no action and do nothing? Shall we let this gangster continue to kidnap our country? Shall we remain kidnapped? Will our child come back? I have said earlier, under the IMF, our child will never come back. Never come back. We have a child come back. I hope that our child will come back. But for our child to come back, we must fight or perish. Thank you. Thank you um, uh, very much, um, uh, Mr. Mandashi. Uh, the good thing is that uh, I'm not one of those who uh, are intelligent. So, um, beauty with that is that I do not have questions. Uh, and I will be handing over to Ayanda, but as I hand over to him, I just want you to have these, uh, the following questions in mind. Um, uh, this is just my uh, slow understanding. One is that I know that uh, when Kwame Nguruma spoke about neo-colonization, he touched on the uh, uh, domination of one by the other and the elements that he touched on was the element of economy and the element of, of security. And so I, I am wondering in my mind if this is not a tool of neo-colonization at the IMF. Secondly, um, a struggle was about self-determination. And I am now wondering, are we ever going to as these sub-Saharan countries, especially the 70 something percent that you highlighted, are we ever going to uh, get to a stage where we can then say that we are defining you know, our own selves, we are chanting our own way, we, we are you know, um, our own destiny as, as these countries. And then the last uh, one, could it not be that um, as we have seen that uh, President MNS Nangwangwa together with his administration have decided to pay, I don't know what they call uh, compensate uh, uh, the farmers in Zimbabwe. Could it not be that their arms have been twisted uh, by these uh, uh, gangsters for him to reverse uh, the gains that we all celebrated 
um, under the presidency and the leadership of, 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 of Reverend um, uh, uh, Mugabe, Robert Gabriel um, Mugabe. I know uh, that we are not talking about Zimbabwe here, but one of my greatest uh, uh, frustrations is that what Zimbabweans are doing would then make it difficult uh, because they will be setting a precedence. They would make it difficult for other countries uh, to, to then refuse compensation, as we know that this has been the debate even in this our beloved uh, motherland. But before you get to that, I just want to check there by U Ayanda if there are questions that are coming through because this is not my platform, but the platform of uh, Wesley Guild members. Over to you, Ayanda. Um, to to our guest, Molom uh, Africa. Um, there is a question from U Siabulela Tonono, um, and it says, "What is the relation between military-industrial complex and Bretton Woods in the EE institutions?" I'm not sure if you. You, you got that one. What is the relation between military industrial complex and the Bretton Woods institutions? Then there is a comment um, from Utumani Matiwane. Uti, the UN through its virus bodies, including the IMF, changed the African agenda for liberation into human rights struggle. Staunch pan African is succumbed to imperial pressure when they chose to protect the property rights when they adopted the human rights regime. Those are the um, two, two things that I'm putting to you. Then I will come back with the other ones as Uku Paula Pizans. Yeah. Uh, uh, my, my, my... Oh, sorry. Yes. No, no thank you. Thank you, sir. You can, you can then begin to reflect. Yeah, let me let me just answer the question about what is the relationship between the uh, um, the military industrial complex and the IMF. Um, so, so, so the United States, for example, as the gang leader, um, uses two tools: the, the military industrial complex, together with the intelligence units of the United States. Um, the the CIA, for example helps overthrow governments of the world. If there is a government that the United States does not like, that government is removed. If you don't believe my point, I can point you back to the Pinochet case in 1974 um, in Chile. I can point you to what happened after the socialist government was removed there. They installed uh, Pinochet a dictator uh, it's not about human rights, it's not about law, it's not about democracy, it's about interest, it's about power, it's about expansion of power in markets. And so that's what happened. Um, the, the military industrial complex, you know, uses its, its arm, it uses itself to transport weapons to very dangerous governments, dictatorial governments, to force these governments uh, out of power, to force governments out of power, which it does not like. It, uh, the US has done a lot of this uh, uh, in Latin America. And if you read uh, various books written by um, a, a Professor Noam Chomsky, um, you get a sense of how the American imperialism has functioned through the use of the military industrial complex. And so there's a great relationship there. So they overthrow governments, and once governments are overthrown, the governments engage, you know, find themselves indebted, and then they are forced to come to the IMF. In other words, countries are forced to bankruptcy uh, by investors pulling out and then forcing these countries to the IMF um, generally. And so that's my answer to that question. Um, I, will, I will respond to uh, some of the questions that the Reverend has raised. Um, um, uh, in my closing remarks um, around uh, Zimbabwe. I'm not sure if I've missed the second one. Uh, 
No, no, no. That that's fine. To be, I will will be. Uh, I will wait for that. Okay, great. Did I miss the second question? The second part of the question after the one about industrial complex? I think it was from someone called Matiwan. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, it, it says the UN through its various bodies, um, including yes. the IMF, changed the African agenda for liberation into yes. a, a human rights struggle. Yes. And he yes. says um, staunch um, Pan-African succumbed to that, to imperial pressure when they chose to protect property rights over liberation. Yes. Yes, I think I think I can I can make a, a comment on that and tie that with what the Reverend was asking, and the point is that it's true that uh, Pan Africanists, and I don't know if I should call them Pan Africanists at all when they have failed to do the simplest thing in the sixties, to unite immediately, and follow the vision of Kwame Nkrumah, unite immediately, with immediate effect, no debate, mm. but they didn't do that. And, that, and that's where the problem actually began. You see, because, they, because the French played a critical role in the failure of Africa to unite by dividing them. Um, they fomented tribal divisions, uh, fomented ethnic divisions, and, and that was a key element. And then they turned the struggle to be about human rights. And then human rights included property rights. And then mm. property rights were now you know, preserved. For who? Because African people had no property rights. Do you own a property? Where is your property? Do you have a farm? Where do you farm? Are you not a worker somewhere in your land? In your land, you're not a landlord. You are renting. A foreigner has come and has caused you to rent. This looks like a Deuteronomy curse for me. That a foreign nation shall come and shall take over your country and shall rule over you. And that's what has happened to us. We, you know, we owe debts. We are constantly paying debts. What, where, we, where the failure has been in the 1990s in this country, to be particular, was when we allowed the IMF to tell this country what the policy is going to be around the question of property, property rights. If you trace back the history of Africa, property was not something that could be sold in the market. How can somebody go and sell land? If you sell the land, where will your children live? This is wrong. This is immoral. This is a political suicide. This is ahistorical. Throughout history, property cannot be brought into the market. But we now, as a consequence, live in a society where you have to take your land and your property, you see, and, and use it as a collateral in a bank when you buy something. What, I mean, what kind of madness is this? Running a state where you, you, you people risk the property, the only residential property they have without ownership of any farm. And that's what happened, Reverend, in Zimbabwe. In 2007, SADC, one of these toothless institutions in Africa, uh, SADC sat down and yielded to the US pressure to force the government of Zimbabwe to pay the white farmers who were apparently uh, expropriated. And the problem is that we keep using the wrong word. We keep using the word expropriation. And when we use that word, we give power to the people from whom we're taking our land back. Because the, the English, the, the, the meaning of the word expropriation in English is basically taking something by force. How can you take your land by force? This is ridiculous. Even if you go to a court of law, you will lose the case because you, 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 you go to a court of law using a problematic legalistic concept that was not even coined by you, coined by your enemies against you necessarily. And that's the challenge. And so the United States has kept the Zimbabwean people choking since 2001 after, under the Zidera Act. And it was renewed in 2018 to keep pressing and pressing and pressing. Now Mnangagwa has yielded. But Mnangagwa is a crocodile indeed. That's what they call him. But who is this crocodile eating? It's eating its own people. Um, there are also 
as any questions that are coming up, um, but I'm not sure in terms of time, uh, we, are, we have passed the, the yeah, hour yeah. That, that was allocated, but I will then entertain um, two more questions. Then you um, yeah. will see, see, see Vale. Um, there okay. is a, a question from Undaba Mlungu. Um, Uti Comrade, Africa, would you say a black cat would have resolved all economical related hinges in this country and also can you be able can you please be straightforward um can you be straightforward for what in regard um zuma and ramaphosa administrations do you think a white cat zuma led government was better than a than a white cat um than a white cat compared to Cyril? thank you then the the, the second one I think I have to answer this one before I, before I forget this one. Let me let me sure. let me answer this one. The sure. the the cat actually has always been white. It's always been a white cat. The idea that he he Mr. Mandela went to the United States and said he didn't care whether the the cat was black or white was the same ridiculous idea that uh, he fought against black and black and white domination as if there was ever a thing like that. So you can see the consistency of the language of liberalism there. Um, you know, in Mr. Mandela. The point there about um, uh, the black or white cat is that even if it was a black cat, you need to explain what is a black cat. You know, he used a metaphor. And if you go on and listen to that speech, he then said, um, you know, uh, we we don't care what the, what the policy is. That's what he meant actually in real terms. We don't care how the economic policy looks like as long as it ends poverty as long as it ends inequality, as long as it ends landlessness. I mean, this is like someone saying, I don't care if uh, the foundation is square, as long as I am building a roundhouse. This is total nonsense. There's nothing like that. When you want to build a society, you become straightforward about the policy you are pursuing. We have always had to be straightforward and say we are pursuing a socialist, anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, anti-colonial, anti-racist society. And the only way you can pursue a socialist policy is if you don't depend for you to eat on an individual farmer to farm food. Because, because in this country, for example, for you to eat, you depend on a farmer who may be unhappy about a policy of government tomorrow and cause a farming and, 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 and cause economic problems for us. If you sell ESCOM, you cause the same problem. If you sell ESCOM, you are in fact saying private individuals must then sell electricity, must then compete uh, on electricity so that if they like, they can cause load shedding in the country to force government to agree on certain policies that the government would otherwise disagree on. So that's what we need to pursue. As of about Zuma and uh, 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 Ramaphosa, I mean, we've got to transcend this notion of party politics uh, because this party politics necessarily forces us to uh, get delayed in terms of what we need to deal with. If you look at that, all the point I was trying to make around it was, you can go from Mandela to Mbeki to, uh, uh, to Zuma, to Ramaphosa. Every time a new leader comes into leadership, there is, there is some false hope. We just suddenly get hope. We say, we hope things are gonna be better now, purely and merely on the basis that we were going to get a new leader. And there's nothing new about any of them. They've always been there, okay? And finally, the point to make is that sometimes we also make a, we also have this, Thing that if we put the if we put the younger generation, things are going to become better. We speak falsely. We don't, you know, we don't solve the problem by putting a wiser, you know, a younger idiot. Okay. If you put a younger idiot, the problem remains the same. If you put an older, wiser socialist, pan-Africanist person, then you put the right person, even if they were ninety years of age. Otherwise, how should uh, someone like 
Abraham to look at the Bible. How should someone like that, how should he have lived about 900 years and still remained wise? Shouldn't he have been youth all the time? Thanks. Um, the, the last question, um, which speaks to um, the African leaders um, and, and, and speaks about Umhlaba. Usebulela Mtati says, what could be the real reason behind African leaders failing to return the land back to its rightful owners in Azania? Is it economically? Then the last one that I want to just uh, so that it is captured. What effect will the approach of occupying unoccupied land will it have on IMF here in South Africa? Those are the two last questions. Yes. In let, let, let me start with the last one. The, uh, the idea that by occupying lands uh, that are un unoccupied, um, we will be getting closer to the problem is fallacious, it's mistaken, it's wrong, it's false. Um, there's, there's nothing wrong when people occupy the land when it's their land, actually. And by the way, the government does not um, the government does not involve anyone when they decide that a certain land is earmarked for um, development. And this development normally means building big, um, big shopping centers where the people get exploited and where uh, things don't really improve. And therefore, there's nothing you know wrong, uh, in my opinion, when people take uh, land. For me, I don't care about the IMF to be quite frank with you. In fact, my, my point of view was that we need to leave the IMF. And, and, and look at it, I mean, if South Africa were to leave the IMF, most, South African, most African countries would follow because they apparently like South Africa and South Africa is liked elsewhere. Now imagine if in these 188 countries, and I said earlier there are 188 countries in the IMF, and I said 75% of them have no power. Imagine if the entire 75% left the IMF and leave the US, Britain, France, and Germany and leave them alone there and establish an entirely new bank, a bank that is not going to, an institution that's not going to dictate and force governments to change their own policy. Finally, um, on the question about why, what, what could be the reason why the African leaders um, do not want to return the land. First of all, I mean, there are many reasons. One of them is that they, they simply don't believe that the land needs to be returned. They hold along with the white people that we don't, what are we going to do with the land? That, that's the question they ask. And, uh, and we ask the question back, what are they doing with the land? What are the ones who are keeping the land doing with it? Okay, and so so what's wrong when we want that land? Um, and, and so, it's the failure of, it's not just the failure of leadership. It's that the interests of these leaders are against the interests of the majority. That's why they are working with the IMF now to reduce what they call a public sector wage bill, where we can have about close to 30,000 people losing jobs. We've got people losing jobs at the SAA. We've got the financial sector cutting jobs, for example, by the thousands. We've got the mining sector, people losing jobs there because profits are more important. And whenever these things happen, there are leaders. There are leaders who keep quiet. Some of these leaders are union leaders. They, they get incorporated into the establishment and they pretend to be representing the interests of the people. It will never work. It's a hoax. It's a given, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a greatest historical scandal to believe that the people who have subjugated and oppressed and exploited us since 1994, that they will certainly come to the fore and solve the problem. It's not gonna happen. We've got to stop depending on filthy, lying, conniving politicians who go to parliament merely for their own stomachs and their own families. We've got to stop that. We've got to defy parliament as an institution as an institution of democracy, as an institution of freedom, and as an institution of liberation. 
parliament as an inherited apartheid institution is itself an apartheid institution. It, it, it is itself an oppressive institution. There's nothing honorable about any of the honorables in that parliament. In fact, they are horribles. Yeah. I have hinted back to you. Yeah. For for the break that uh, DPI do not know my brother if you have any closing remarks so that I can in the interest uh, of time uh, I do want to say to the followers and to those who are viewing us that you have promised that you shall uh, make this paper available. And I'm sure that the um, admins of this group will uh, inform people once the paper um, is available. I just want to give you a minute or so to do your, your closing uh, remarks before we pray and we end the program. Thank you, Reverend. And uh, let me thank you and your audience for giving me audience in terms of speaking about these issues. Um, I'm grateful because this gives me an opportunity to talk about the things that I also care about and things that I think anyone who has a child or who is a child of somebody cares about them. And in closing, I'm going to say that the country, this country of ours is kidnapped and it was kidnapped by apartheid thugs they gave it to the IMF thug and we lived under the gangster and we're still under the gangster today. Like that mother at the beginning who thought that by paying more money to the IMF, the problems are going to go away. I want to remind your viewers that the problems are not going to go away as long as there is IMF. What is going to happen? There will be more exploitation, more privatization, and the people we have put in parliament will continue to enjoy and stay happily ever after in parliament. And for them, it's always about calculating power. It's not about the people. It's about noise. They will, they will, they will get us together when they want us to do what they want. But when we want them to do what, they, what we want them to do, they will never. Why? Because the interests of politicians and the interests of the IMF and the business and the interests of corporations are completely and diametrically opposed to those of the people in a mathematical sense. Thank you. Chico Onamanza Onke. Otengel Kesha was Sipa Fefe. Logo was sitting and Trizione, Sitanda Zangabani. Otegananjalo was Timbi Sangoba Tiko Hanganababini. Logo Bango Si, but Hatu, a Kamin Lako. Uba Pe is in to Abas Telayo. In Zagalogungo Si, Jengo Muena. No tandas away to Tina's Tagazako. Jengo Balendo go see Google Tandas at Fanele. Sipengo see Quelliliswe. Ogoba Masiazi in Yanisoyako. Uzengo see Usi Pebuliswe in Lizaubako. Ubomi Ogunguna Pagate. Wanga Kungaba Koge Kuninonke. Ufefe lengosie tu Yesu Kristo utando luka tito ubudlela na nomoya oyinwele si de si bu yesonge si bona ne singaba pilileyo amen and to those who were following us all I can say those who have viewed this program is that as Africans. Giving up is a luxury that we can never afford. When these debates and these discussions are brought, 
It's so that we can get rid, amongst other things, of ignorance. So that we are more knowledgeable and aware. In the language of the politicians, we become conscious. And so I just want to say to us, this was not meant to demotivate you. Instead, it was meant to inspire all of us. And so we thank God for Um Zalwanu Mandashe, and we pray God's blessing and protection, wisdom upon him as he continues to share his views with us on different platforms. Do follow him on Facebook. He has a page which he normally shares and reflects. Um, and so look out for the book that he's writing also on leadership for those who are interested to understand the dynamics of leadership. One of the most important points that he makes there is that leadership is something that is very slippery in its nature. It needs to be handled with care. It is fragile. And so I know that it will be out very soon. God bless you until we meet again.